The four Gospels are typically divided into two subcategories. Off on its own, you have the Gospel of John with its specific focus and way of presenting the life and teachings of Jesus. And then together we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and collectively they are known as the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means same vision or same perspective, and they essentially tell the story of Jesus' life and ministry in the same way, but with differing details. The most detailed account of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ comes from the Gospel of Luke. Luke's Gospel is so detailed that only in chapter 4 do we get to the first movements in Jesus' ministry. And then finally, it's not till chapter 5 that we see Jesus calling his first apostles. And that's what we're looking at today. This is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And this is the Gospel reading for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. So here's the reading, and then I'll give you the notes from the online Bible study at St. Nicholas Church earlier this week. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. The Lake of Gennesaret was another name for the Sea of Galilee, and Capernaum was on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and as I said, that was the the home base for Jesus' earthly ministry, his ministry of preaching the good news. The British biblical scholar N.T. Wright makes an interesting observation about this region, the geography of this region. So N.T. Wright said that along the lake shore close to Capernaum, there is a sequence of steep inlets a zigzagging shoreline with each inlet forming a natural amphitheater. To this day, if you get in a boat and push off a little from the shore, you can talk in a quiet, natural voice, and anyone on the slopes of the inlet can hear you clearly, more clearly, in fact, than if you were right there on the shore with them. So Jesus, he uh, he makes use of this natural feature uh, so that everybody can hear him. Notice in verse 3, it says that Jesus sat down and began to teach. Sitting was the traditional position of a teacher in in those days. So if you went to see a teacher and everybody would be mulling around and when the teacher sat down, everybody knew that was the cue that that he was about to begin the lesson that he was going to give them so everybody would be quiet and listen to the teacher. Okay, uh, verses 4 to 7. So when he finishes teaching... He asks Peter to launch into the deep and let down the nets for a catch. So this is an interesting thing because, in a sense, it is a foreshadowing of the entire arc, if you will, of the gospel. Uh, Because when Christ finishes his earthly ministry, he sends out his apostles and disciples into the world to preach the good news. So we have in verse 10, we'll see right away, that Jesus says to Peter and the rest, from now on you will catch men. So in a sense, what's happening here is this story at the beginning of Jesus' ministry where he calls the apostles is like a summary, if you will, of the entire story. It's like if you've ever read uh, an academic paper, they begin with an abstract. They begin with a little summary of what you're going to read in that paper. So in a sense, this story is an abstract of what you're going to hear now in the rest of Luke's gospel that he's going to unpack in in, in quite a bit of detail. Another interesting thing here is when it says launch into the deep. The symbol of uh, going into the deep is 
to take the gospel, if we again, if we connect it up to this idea of the gospel, it's to take the gospel to the farthest reaches. Another way of saying it might be to the fringes. Take it as far away as possible. That there's no corner of the earth, there's no corner of humanity that gets neglected with the gospel. Now in verses 5, 6, and 7, we have this very uh, interesting response of Peter to, to Jesus' instruction. Uh, before that, though, the Orthodox Study Bible has this interesting observation. It says, the Lord draws people to himself by things that are familiar to them. As he drew the Magi with a star, as he would draw the tax collectors by a tax collector, here he draws the fishermen with fish. And the study Bible references 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in which we read, I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. So we meet people where they are. We actually reference this as well in the liturgy of St. Basil in the Anaphora, in the Eucharistic prayers. Uh, we pray, be all things to all people, O Lord, who knows each person and his request, each home and its need. The idea here is that you, you look for common ground. The way to preach the gospel is to look for common ground, to find a point of connection in a place that is familiar to the person, and then build on it from there. So we can see a great example of this in the book of Acts, when Paul goes to Athens and he goes up to Mars Hill. And at Mars Hill, there's this, the temples and there's the temple of the unknown God. And so Paul says, let me tell you about this God that doesn't have a name. Let me tell you who that God is. So you, you make the connection where somebody is at to something familiar to them and use that as the opening then to be able to preach the gospel. And that, that example comes from Jesus himself. Now, Peter's response here in verse 5 is a really solid example of discipleship. You know, he says, well, master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, we'll go and we'll do it. Discipleship is about being able to follow the Lord, even when, when what he's asking us doesn't seem to make sense to us. <laughs> you know, uh, it makes sense to him. Uh, but even if it doesn't make sense to us, that we follow him anyway. We see this a couple of times already in the Gospel of Luke, uh, in uh, the story of the Annunciation, when the archangel says to Mary that she's been called to be the mother of the Messiah. She says, how can that be? I've, I've never known a man. Nevertheless, let it be to me according to your word. Uh, even before that, in Luke chapter 1, we have the parents of, of John the Baptist, Zacharias and Elizabeth, that are unable to conceive. And they're the ones who become, again, the parents of the forerunner by the grace of God. The point being that what looks to us to be hopeless is full of hope in the eyes of God. Peter here is a great example of this, even though by all indications shouldn't have caught anything. And he could have very easily said, I don't know if you know anything about fishing here, but this isn't looking very good. Uh, he doesn't do that. He says, okay. You said it, we'll do it. And he goes, and of course, they catch this, this great catch of fish. And again, Peter's reaction is very typical of something that we see in the scriptures. They pull the fish in. There's so many fish that they need their, their friends to come and help them. And, and the boats are sinking because they have such a huge catch of fish. And it says in verse 8 that when Simon Peter saw it, he fell on it at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter here is not rejecting Jesus, but what he's doing is he's showing us this very classical biblical reaction when somebody encounters the power and the glory of God. So if we look in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah has this vision of the Lord sitting on his throne and the house is filled with smoke, and the, the angels are around him singing, Holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah's immediate reaction is to say, Woe is me, for I am undone. Just at the magnitude of the glory and the holiness of, of, of what's happened, it's overwhelming. And so, so Peter here is overwhelmed by, by this act of God that he's witnessed. And, and so, so often then, the response 
of the angel or the holy person to the to, to these people in this reaction is to say, don't be afraid, which is exactly what Jesus says to Peter, don't be afraid. When we come before God, there's this tremendous sense of, wow, I don't really belong here, but we are there anyway, and we're there because of the grace of God. We, have, we don't deserve to be there, even though we're not worthy. He counts us as if we are worthy. Now, in verse 9, St. Gregory the theologian uh, talks about this, for now, from now on you will catch men, and he says, Christ bowed down to all in order that he might draw forth a fish from the deep, that is, man swimming in the ever-changing scenes and bitter storms of this life. So the waters are a symbol of, of the world, the depths, the dangers that are there. I think you've heard me say before, not a lot of people could swim at this time. When you went out into the deep, you, you were literally surrounded by death. And so the gospel goes to this place so that it can draw us out of the perilous, broken, fallen world to give us life. We actually reference this on Pentecost. The, uh, the Troparion, the, the anthem of the Feast of Pentecost begins with the words, Blessed are you, Christ our God. You have revealed the fishermen as most wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit. Through them you drew the world into your net. Pentecost is the fulfillment of what Jesus promises them here in Luke chapter 5, that from now on you will catch men. Two of the images that Jesus uses for evangelism are fishing and farming. And obviously, one reason he does that is because that's the people that he's talking to. He is taking his gospel to the, to the, the people of the land, to the, the fishermen and the farmers. But there's this other thing that I think is interesting about fishing and farming that applies to evangelism. And it's the fact that you have to have patience. For fishing and farming, you've got to be patient. And you have to remember that not everything is in your control. That you have to accept the reality of your situation and work with what you've got. And I think that's a very important lesson for the church in terms of evangelism. When we do evangelism, it's the long game that we're playing. You know, we, we shouldn't uh, expect immediate results, or if things kind of just stop for a while, this is all part of the of the ebb and the flow. And uh, again, fishing and farming should teach us that it takes time. We need to do the things that we need to do in order to get the gospel out there. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit who will bring the, the catch in. So I think that's a really important image for us to keep in our minds when we talk about evangelism and church growth, fishing and farming. Verse 10 it says that along with Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also there. Luke names them as Jesus starts the, his ministry. Then they'll be the ones towards the end, just before the Passion. They're the three that are with him on the mountain on Mount Tabor to witness the transfiguration. So the whole thing kind of comes full circle at the beginning and the end of his, his earthly ministry through Peter, James, and John. So it says, when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all, they left everything else behind them, and they followed Jesus. This reminds us of something that we hear quite regularly in our services. Let us offer ourselves and each other and our entire life to Christ. As we think about all the saints that have done this throughout the ages, Right in the Gospels, and at the beginning of the Gospel, we have this example. Obviously, we have Mary. Uh, we have these apostles as well. And, you know, this is the challenge of being a disciple, that we end up having to go into uncharted territory and leaving the familiar behind to find something more meaningful that speaks to the heart of our being. So they have this, their boats, their livelihood, their community, their their families and that must have been a a very uh, difficult decision and, and it must have left them with some trepidation at some points along the way but nevertheless they do it and of course by being willing to do that they end up becoming the, the great apostles and the first preachers of the the resurrection to the world in discipleship it's not always physically moving somewhere that god wants us to do 
Uh, more often, it's kind of cognitive moving. It's putting aside old ways of thinking, old ways of solving problems, old priorities, those kinds of familiar things for the life that Jesus calls us to in the gospel. And that can be very difficult work because old habits, even ones we don't like, at least they're familiar territory. And so it can be very difficult to leave those things, to leave old coping mechanisms behind for the sake of Christ and for the sake of his gospel. But it speaks to how we enter into an authentic way of living. You know, we have what we look at ourselves as, our own particular interests, talents, what have you. Well, that's one thing. But God's will for us, that's where the real fulfillment happens. And that's where, that's where the fullness of life that Jesus comes to promise us, that's where we find it. We have to be able to enter into that regardless of the cost. Because anything else is only in like a half-life. And that's not easy. And that's why being a Christian is like those instructions on the back of a shampoo bottle, uh, repeat as needed. You know, none of this is, is easy. It does require us to refocus, reorient uh, ourselves back to him and to keep doing this. And because we see that also in the lives of these apostles, because clearly here they're all in, but there'll be points in their time with Jesus where they're not all in. So even the apostles face this, this kind of stepping back from this and needing to reapply themselves and press forward. We'll have better days and worse days. We just have to you know, wake up the next day and, and it's a new day and keep focusing on following him and, and where he takes us. That's where we need to go because that is the way, that is the truth, and that really is the fullness of life. As we look at this reading, we see a common theme throughout the passage. From verse 5, when Simon says that he's toiled all night and caught nothing, but if Jesus wants them to, then he'll set out his boat one more time. To verse 8, his reaction at the massive catch of fish, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. All the way to verse 11, leaving everything to follow Jesus when he called them. The common thread in all of it is humility. It takes a great deal of humility to say to God, thy will be done, and not say to him, thy will be done after I'm finished doing this or that, or thy will be done after I take care of these or those priorities. To forsake everything and follow Christ, to put Jesus and his gospel first, means letting go of the desire to always have it our way, and to say the same thing that Jesus said to the Father in Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. The apostles didn't always get this, or at least they didn't always stick to it. But when they did, the glory of God was revealed to them to give them healing and strength and hope in their journey and in their ministry. And so it is with all of his believers. It takes practice. It takes time. But in doing this, we discover we don't lose anything because it is in this complete offering of ourselves to God in humility that we discover the fullness of our humanity. True meaning in life can only be found in the one who made us and in the one who calls us to life through his gospel, our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening today. Until next time, take care and God bless.